remind everyone that we are recording this event. Please stay on mute. You may type any questions you might have in the chat box and we'll address these during or at the end of the presentation. We will also open the floor at the end so that you can unmute your mic and ask your questions then. And now for our speakers. I'll let those people in in a minute. So now for our speakers, Dr. Atul Chug is a board certified cardiologist who joined Franciscan Physician Network Indiana Heart Physicians in July 2016. He is the managing partner at IHP and is a clinical hypertension specialist. He is also medical director of cardiovascular research at Franciscan Health. His training includes an internship in internal medicine at the University of Massachusetts and a residency at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. He completed a fellowship in hypertensive disease at the University of Chicago, working with the preeminent scholars in the field. He then did his fellowship in cardiovascular disease at the University of Louisville Medical Center, where he was chief fellow and completed his training at the Johns Hopkins University in advanced cardiac imaging. He has been a national principal investigator in cardiovascular trials funded by the National Institute of Health, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And he has over 100 pub publications, including manuscripts, abstracts, and book chapters. And his work has been cited over 3,000 times. Our second speaker is Dr. Mark Gerdish. He trained in general and then cardiovascular thora and thoracic surgery at Loyola University Medical Center in Chicago, where he remains on staff as a, an associate professor of thoracic and cardiovascular surgery. He is a partner in Cardiac Surgery Associates, the largest private cardiac group in the country, and became chief of cardiothoracic surgery at Franciscan Health Indianapolis in 2006. With focus on heart valve disease, Dr. Gerdish has developed a recognized center for heart valve repair and innovation, including lead enrollment in multiple pivotal trials, and first in man with devices with regenerative technology. Dr. Gerdish is a national principal investigator for a heart valve regeneration device and is instrumental in the development of a multi-institution database to assess success in management of atrial fibrillation. Welcome to our speakers, and I will let you take it away, Dr. Chud. Thank you very much. It's always an honor to um, speak in front of uh, the, the teams here in Franciscan, um, and I think that it's rather impactful when we go ahead and look at the data uh, because they think that the downstream effects of talks like this are always fairly palpable. So uh, without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, I wanted to sort of, um, the talk is uh, scheduled in two parts. Uh, my part will have to do with the epidemiology, the mechanism of aortic regurgitation, methods of detection and guidelines, and I want to spend a little time on developing technologies. Um, one of those technologies will be covered uh, in greater detail by uh, by Dr. Gerdish um, as it pertains to our workflows and our um, uh, new um, tools in the toolbox, which I think we're all very excited about. <clears throat> so let's talk a little about the epidemiologic burden of uh, aortic regurgitation. Uh, the Framingham Heart Study uh, revealed uh, that the prevalence of aortic regurgitation uh, was not a, a rare event. Uh, in men, uh, overall prevalence was known to be 13%, while in women it was 8.5%. But mind you, the Framingham Heart Study was a, was a long-term longitudinal study, which really studied a fairly, um, a fairly healthy population. So this burden of disease is certainly uh, was a little bit unexpected. Um, just like most things um, uh, with cardiovascular disease, uh, certain differences in men and women that must be pointed out. Um, prevalence of moderate and severe uh, predates uh, women uh, by about a decade. And as you can see here with females, we see that, um, that uh, increased uh, frequency of more advanced disease uh, as uh, in that uh, later decade. And again, going back to just general uh, numbers uh, in uh, the Framingham study, uh, the overall prevalence of mild aortic regurgitation was 13.6, with significant being defined here as moderate or severe, was 1.6%. Again, uh, very high numbers when we think about the, the prevalence of a valve disease that we often don't, uh, uh, unfortunately, um, get a chance to look at. Let's go ahead and get someone on mute there if we can. <clears throat> 
overall population wise, if we were to look at aortic disease or aortic valve disease as a whole, uh, we see that there are differences between stenosis and insufficiency. And uh, about an annual um, prevalence of disease of 300,000 um, annually of insufficiency and a mixed disease of about 200,000 uh, comprising both 27 and 18 percent respectively. So again, um, while uh, not as um, while the pure um, lesion is not as prevalent as we see with stenosis, um, the numbers, if we add the mixed disease, really is, um, uh, again, another um, high number. Unfortunately, in the general population, and as we look at patterns of, of disease management, unfortunately, we see that aortic regurgitation is, is oftentimes treated just like stenosis. And what I mean by this is that the that the stenosis, um, as we all sort of have used as gospel from the past, is, is a lesion that we treat upon the onset of, of symptoms. And that's when we really start acting um, to, to really treat the disease, even though there have been some minor paradigm shifts in that um, thought process. However, with regurgitation, um, that uh, is, surely, is surely not the way we must proceed with this lesion, simply because we often see the, uh, the maladaptive changes in the heart prior to the patient being symptomatic. So by the time the patient is symptomatic, oftentimes the, the horse is out of the barn. Uh, and I'll go ahead and point to um, what I mean by that in these um, uh, in these next slides. Now, um, mechanisms of aortic regurgitation are multiple, and we go back to sort of the anatomic um, classification of the Carpentier um, uh, method, and really sort of uh, the type one A uh, to D. Um, the the first three really have to do with some sort of dilatation. So type 1A would be dilatation distal to the aortic root uh, of the tubular portion of the proximal aorta, leading to um, uh, dilatation um, and, of course, um, uh, 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 subsequent regurgitation. Type B, uh, again, uh, is, the, uh, is, the, is dilatation of the root, while 1C is dilatation of the, of the annulus. Type 1D uh, is uh, uh, classified as a result of perforation uh, of the valve leaflets. Uh, and uh, when we're thinking about mental calisthenics as to how to remember this, 1D, we think of drugs, D for drugs. Again, these are the sort of shenanigans that I have to play with myself uh, when I'm going to um, be sitting for uh, a board exam. Um, type 2 and type 3, a little bit different. Type 2 is prolapse of one of the aortic valve leaflets, while type 3 is simply malcoaptation uh, of the valve leaflets as a result of shortening, um, usually due to scarring of the, of the valve tissue. And again, this is a nice summary uh, of, of that uh, in, in, in a tabular form. As we go into the, the, the pathophysiology of the disease, uh, we're looking at multiple um, hemodynamic changes that really um, relegate um, what occurs uh, in the general disease process. And what I think fundamentally aortic regurgitation is, is an increase in the stroke volume while having a decrease in the systemic circulatory volume, which is a mismatch, if you will, right? I mean, this is, a, this is important to, to understand, is that the issue here is that as the aortic regurgitation occurs um, and we see more backflow into the left ventricle, um, despite having a greater stroke volume um, as a result of this, we now see more of that going backwards, which means the resultant amount of volume that's downstream past the vascular uh, uh, ventricular valvular apparatus is going to be less. Now, as a result of this, a few things happen. Number one, you have an increase in diastolic filling of the left ventricle. So now not only do you have a, um, a diastolic filling occurring through the natural process from the left atrium into the left ventricle through the mitral valve, but you now also have a backflow uh, from the aortic valve. So now you've got blood going back into the left ventricle from two separate sources. This increases the heart rate as a result of trying to keep up with the, um, the, the, the general um, uh, volume within the vascular um, uh, compartment, leading again to increasing the LV stroke volume and LV dilatation. 
The major concern, and again, the most important thing is of all the valvular lesions in the heart, the valvular lesion that's going to be the most likely to cause left ventricular dilatation, it'll be aortic regurgitation. That is always the answer. Now, going back into the into the aorta, which again is a really important conduit and actually it works in junction with the left ventricle uh, in order to propagate um, uh, uh, blood flow forward as a result of its muscularity and its dynamic changes through systole and diastole. Now you see decreased systemic circulation volume into the into the aorta. Now, as a result of this decreased volume, the next natural step for our bodies to, to compensate for this decreased amount of circulatory volume is to increase the systemic vascular resistance. In order to allow for less blood to do more work, we need to constrict those blood vessels so that we allow them to go downstream so they get to the farthest reaches of this of the vascular beds, so they get to our all the way to our toes, to the to the very um, uh, the distal or small portions of our brains. Now, this, of course, leads to, again, uh, an increase in the systolic pressure. Going back to perhaps uh, more uh, a classical um, theory and classical hemodynamics, as we look at this, um, both uh, in terms of um, uh, pressure uh, volume curves, uh, and we look at um, the uh, general thought process of what's occurring uh, at each of the chambers. As you can see here, on the left is the normal heart, and on the right here is an aortic regurgitation um, in, uh, sort of uh, plagued heart. On the left side here, as you can see, left atrial pressure about 10, and the left atrial pressure equal and the, and the left um, uh, ventricular end diastolic pressure um, equaling the left atrial pressures, right? So um, that allows that pressure to, to again, uh, remain um, low in the left ventricle. And as you can see here, a narrow pulse pressure with a normal um, systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Now, what occurs here because of this regurgitant volume that occurs in, in, in most part during diastole, first thing that occurs, as you can see here, is a decrease in the diastolic pressure, as we talked about as a result of the fact that we have now increased stroke volume and, of course, syst increased systemic vascular resistance as a result of less blood in this compartment, you have an increase in the, in the systolic blood pressure leading to this wide pulse pressure. And as you can see here, because you've got now two sources of diastolic filling, uh, you now have an increase in the LV EDP. And I guess, I guess in terms of a more macro change, as you see the left ventricle, you're seeing this very prominent left ventricular dilatation. Again, all part of the, um, the pathophysiology of aortic regurgitation. And this in summary, of course, tells us all the same. Again, um, uh, sort of a, a nice um, depiction of how that all uh, plays in its cascade. Now, mind you, the, the, the pathophysiology of acute aortic regurgitation is very different, but we'll leave that for another conversation because that's not really what we're dealing with mostly in our patient population. So as we go down the guidelines, we sort of go through um, the diagnosis and sort of things that we do in order for us to really get the diagnosis of aortic regurgitation. I think the first thing that we all need to, to recognize, no matter how much hubris we may have as cardiologists, is that our ability to pick up aortic regurgitation is somewhat limited. And if there's going to be a lesion that we're going to miss in terms of, a, especially in terms of severity, aortic regurgitation is going to be fairly high on the list. And I'll go ahead and uh, show you some data to suggest that what I'm talking about may have some truth to it. Now, um, just the importance that I think I want to talk about is that as guidelines have changed, the importance of transthoracic quantitative assessment certainly came to the forefront. The importance of LV function and change in LV function also was more highlighted. And the fact that multimodality imaging for the, for the uh, diagnosis and prognostication of aortic regurgitation really came to the forefront as we looked at the guidelines and as more data came through the door. Again, um, for for the cardiologists here, again, a very quick review. I really don't want to uh, belabor this uh, for too long, but I think it's important for for others to also realize that there's a very um, sort of um, a, a, sort of a, a multitude of of criteria that we use for echocardiographic grading uh, of aortic regurgitation and mild uh, aortic regurgitation. Really, sort of is a vena contracta of less than 0.3. 
uh, regurgitant volume of less than 30, and an ERO of less than 0.10. Uh, the severe aortic regurgitation would be a Doppler jet width of, of greater than 65%. Again, mind you, this is probably going to be the least um, uh, predictive of severe uh, aortic regurgitation, probably the most objective that we use um, based on what uh, the geometry of the uh, left ventricular outflow tract looks like. The vena contractive greater than 0.6, a regurgitant volume of greater than 60, and a regurgitant fraction of greater than 50, which is, again, sort of the common um, cutoff for all regurgitant um, lesions, and the ERO of 0.3. Again, if you're looking at this vis-a-vis -vis the issues of mitral regurgitation, all you're doing is decreasing this by a magnitude of 0.1, and you've got the criteria for, for severe aortic regurgitation, an easy way to kind of remember how to do this. But again, it's important that what's really critical is that, and one of the things that that I think that as 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 referring physicians, as you're looking at this, I want you to realize that you know there is sometimes this becomes more art than science, and one of the reason why I say that is, is that it's very common to have one of these parameters uh, really sort of point towards severe, while another parameter points towards mild. And then it becomes uh, sort of a, a game of weighing all the evidence that we see on, on echocardiograms um, to really sort of get a sense of where are we? Are we mild? Are we moderate? Are we severe? Or are we going to go ahead and hedge it by saying it's moderate to severe? Or are we going to go ahead and say, well, we need more imaging? And I think this is where we sometimes get to a point where um, echocardiography in its current state sort of ends up being the last stage of us uh, grading this lesion, which I think sometimes um, does the patient a disservice because we do think that in the, in the current era, and especially here at Franciscan, we have some pretty important uh, um, tools that can help us further adjudicate uh, in cases where we have dis um, disparate um, data that doesn't give us what we need, um, doesn't give us sort of the clear cut answer. Now, again, with left ventricular dilatation, uh, the most important thing I think to realize is, is that the cutoff um, for the marker of left ventricular dilatation, now again, the, when we intervene will be based upon whether or not there is evidence of, um, of left ventricular dilatation and how do you measure this? Uh, in the past, we would be very much relegated to left ventricular end diastolic di diameters and just one point um, uh, measurements, as you see on the top here with the M mode. But really, the cutoff here is um, the 25 millimeters per meter squared as the cutoff for intervention uh, when we see severe aortic regurgitation. When we see this cutoff, that's the time to intervene. Now, again, this story still requires a little bit more looking into, and we'll go into that in just a minute. So for patients with signs or symptoms of aortic regurgitation, a transthoracic echocardiogram is indicated, and that's a class one indication. Class one indication uh, for a patient with known bicuspid aortic valve or known dilatation of aortic sinuses or, or, or dilated aorta, again, the transthoracic in, um, echocardiogram is indicated. But just as importantly, patients with moderate or severe aortic regurgitation and suboptimal TE images or TTE images uh, and, and discrepancy between clinical and TTE findings means the transthoracic echocardiograph findings and the clinical story that you're really getting are not matching up. That's the time to really use a TE, a cardiac MRI, or a cardiac catheterization to help us um, figure all this out. Again, why is it that echocardiograms are, can be somewhat limited? And part of that has to do with the fact is how the, the ultrasound probe is uh, oriented to the, to the, to the uh, jet of the aortic valve. The, as you all remember, um, the uh, uh, the echocardiogram is nothing more than a fan uh, of sound that goes through a certain cut point. And oftentimes what ends up happening is that this fan of ultrasound beam is perpendicular to the PISA. In other words, the, where this jet is emanating. If you can't really see where the PISA is, you really aren't really appreciating where that valve is, where that valve regurgitation is. Um, the true extent of it. So if you see it perpendicular, of course, that's a problem. And unfortunately, that leads to um, underdiagnosis of it. Now, import, another important um, uh, issue when it comes to uh, aortic, uh, uh, again, uh, both echocardiograms, uh, both with TEE and, um, t uh, and um, transthoracic echocardiography, is that the mere fact of the, is that your, your sensitivity and spatial resolution will be best when you are closest to the beam. 
right? So if this is where the beam is coming from, and this is where you're looking, this is where you're going to be most likely to pick up um, smaller structures. As that beam fans out, now you've got more distance between each of the subbeams that are coming through here. And as a result of it, you're not going to be able to pick up things that have smaller um, uh, diameters or smaller size. So oftentimes you're going to miss these narrow jets. And again, the important piece about aortic regurgitation is that aortic regurgitation will be a summation of multiple regurgitant jets that are small. And since we, we may not be able to pick those smaller ones up and only pick up the larger ones, so that we're not really capturing the true extent of the valve lesion. And I guess another point I think to make and is important is that the what we've been doing with 3D imaging in TEE and even with transthoracic echocardiogram has been really critical to um, allowing us to really get a sense of two things. Number one, we know that the 3D imaging allows us for greater um, uh, or, or more accurate left ventricular um, uh, volumetric um, imaging uh, as opposed to just standard uh, trans, um, uh, 2D imaging. And studies have shown that looking at LV geometry and volumes with 3D um, echocardiography, especially in, in, in uh, good quality uh, echoes, are on par with uh, cardiac MRI when it looks to um, volumes of the left ventricle. Now, why is this important? Because I just we just uh, uh, told you just uh, we just talked about it that left ventricular dilatation is going to be that major cut point to say, well, when is it time for us to really intervene on a valve? So, the, so that having 3D imaging not only helps us with the volumetric aspect of it, but also goes back to mechanism. Now, as you can see here, uh, what we can uh, really appreciate with with, with 3D ED is not only the valve leaflets, but also the annulus and surrounding tissue to really give us a sense of what's really happening here. And so um, I think it's important for us to sort of talk a little bit about cardiac MRI here, because I think the 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 use of cardiac MRI has really been a game changer um, for all of us uh, here at Franciscan and our ability to, to really kind of um, look at this lesion in, in greater detail. So again, one of the things that I think must be important to realize is that when we look at cardiac MRI measurements, remember we looked at those cutoff points, we saw the guidelines and what we said, everything from the um, regurgitant fraction of 50%, et cetera, cardiac MRI measurements um, and how they correlate with the echo is different. So here, when we look at the echo cutoffs, echo cutoff of regurgitant fraction on the echo side is, is 50%. MRI is lower. It's 30%. Low reversal is about the same. Again, when we look at the left ventricular end diastolic index, um, uh, left ventricular end diastolic volume, cutoff here being uh, less than 80 and here a little bit greater than 100. So again, because we're able to cut through um, some of the um, and differentiate between trabeculation and actual cavity, this cutoff is higher. So left ventricular and diastolic volume cutoffs are going to be higher. Now, this is important, is that looking at end volumes may uh, have some greater predictive value uh, than looking at just um, uh, sort of one-dimensional cutoff points, something that we have to, um, that we'll sort of need to focus on. Now, why cardiac MRI? When we look at the correlation of the regurgitant volume of CMR versus TTE, and we look at the predictive value of a patient either going to A, surgery as the primary indication, or B, hospitalization of heart failure, secondary or valve regurgitation, we found greater correlation to these endpoints with cardiac MRI with the area under the curve of 0.9 versus 0.6 with transthoracic cardiography. So again, we may be, as a result of some of our um, uh, challenges with the modalities and not maybe employing multimodality imaging for this lesion, we may be undercutting um, the true burden of the disease in our patient population here at Franciscan and maybe uh, withholding therapies from them um, if um, it, uh, un unfortunately. This is a very good case that really kind of tells you and tells it all. This is a Franciscan case. So uh, again, on the on the left here is a case that was read as mild by the reader. And as you can see here, and I'm going to point you to the direction here, there's a regurgitant jet that's coming forward here, um, hitting that lateral wall, but not really well seen. 
Um, when we look at the pressure half time, we see that there's 469, so sort of in that moderate range. But one of the things that sort of um, gets us in the range or maybe makes us think a little bit differently about this is that you do see that the that the density of the jet is a little bit um, is, is quite dense. Well, we said, okay, fine, that may be it, but boy, the patient doesn't seem to be doing very well, and I think this aortic regurgitation may be worse. This is where we employed 4D flow. Now, mind you, 4D flow is, is a really, really neat tool that we use in cardiac MRI. We're really pleased to be one of the few centers in the country that actually has it. If we're looking at it regionally, um, the next place over that has it is going to be the Cleveland Clinic, which I've never really heard of. But the long and the short of it is that when we classified this, uh, it classified to severe. And all you really need to see is the extent of this jet that's really coming out and seeing the thickening of that valve, and not only seeing how the how how thick that valve is coming off the valve, but looking at the regurgitant volume of this entire jet that's not only hitting the left ventricle uh, and in the lateral wall of the left ventricle, but to the point where it's actually bouncing off and then sort of having this almost coanda effect into the apex. As you can see here from the LVOT, again, Look at the, the size of this jet compared to what we saw in echocardiogram. And there we saw a recurrent fraction of 47%, well over the 30% that we would use as the cutoff in cardiac MRI, and ultimately that patient received surgery. Now, there are a few, um, as we were going into AI and seeing more, more sophisticated tools to help us with the sensitivity of this, we now have more machine-based learning to allow us to improve the sensitivity of aortic regurgitation. Now, on the top two... Um, uh, panels here in systole and diastole, what you're seeing is an aortic regurgitation um, jet using our usual 4D flow imaging. And as you can see here, we are not really seeing much of a jet. However, when we go ahead and use more, when, when the 4D flow data is then cleaned up using fluid dynamic calculations with, with machine learning AI, we now have greater sensitivity specificity that allows us to pick up more regurgitation. Now, I'll, I'll ask you to look at the, these panels on the bottom. And as you can see here during systole, you really get a better sense of the turbulence that's occurring right here at the ventricular vascular junction. And then in diastole, you're seeing a much more defined jet here in diastole. Now, when you look at all this together, you say, well, okay, this allows us to maybe even clean up um, 4D flow further, and again, how technology is helping us um, get to um, a, a much better chance of getting the answer that we need. Now, interestingly enough, uh, one of the things that we always have to bear in mind is that unfortunately, <clears throat> valvular disease occurs not in isolation, but often in concert, because the same pathologic processes that govern regurgitation in one valve also govern the same in the in, in the adjacent valves. And in this study by Yang, we saw about 1,240 patients who had 86% um, uh, had pure AR, while 14% also had concomitant mitral regurgitation, whether that be organic or functional. And of course, the addition of that, the addition of the mitral regurgitation had a major um, uh, risk factor um, uh, influence um, for more, all cause mortality over a follow up period of 5.2 years. So, again, this is not a um, benign issue. And this is a, sort of an interesting case. But as you can see here, there's a patient who had severe mitral regurgitation and some degree of aortic regurgitation. Now, if you say you look at this, you say, okay, fine, that's a little spit of AR regurgitation. I'm not getting too excited about this. But this is a case that I did with uh, uh, Dr. Sheikh, I think it was a couple of years ago. But what happened here is that as soon as we put that mitral, and what we're seeing here, this little structure in the middle, is a mitral clip. Now, after going ahead and fixing one valve, Look what happened to this aortic, what happened to this regurgitant lesion. We're seeing a lot more aortic regurgitation now. And of course, that uh, in itself has to do with the fact that once you have the increased amount of stroke volume as a result of the fact that you now mitigated this backward flow, and now you've got more of it going this way, you now uncover you've got another valve lesion that probably needs to be fixed um, uh, at some point in this patient's lifetime. Now, unfortunately, if this patient went to mitral clip, most likely they were high surgical risks. And there is some data as it's emerging of using TAVR for aortic regurgitation, but that story is still in process as the technology gets better. Uh, but we'll leave that for another conversation. 
Again, um, looking at our guidelines, um, the guideline differentiation is that it's a 2A indication for surgery. If we see severe AR based on the guideline driven um, cut points that we talked about, if the patient has a left ventricular ejection fraction of um, greater than 50% and an L LV um, um, end diastolic volume of either 25 mm per square, um, then and uh, and uh, and diastolic uh, and systolic um, diameter of um, 25 millimeter grade of, uh, over a uh, meter square. It's a two-way indication at that time for surgery. Of course, if the ejection fraction is less than 55%, that patient has a class one indication for surgery at that time. And a 2B indication, if you see progressive decrease in the left ventricular ejection fraction to less than 55% to 60%, and an increase in LVDP, a left ventricular and diastolic diameter of greater than 65 millimeters on at least three studies, and the patient has a low surgical risk, that patient would also go for surgery. Now, we talk about symptoms um, often, and we say, well, the patient's asymptomatic, the patient's asymptomatic, leave them alone. And the story that we have for aortic stenosis still holds for aortic regurgitation is, okay, how do you really uncover some of these symptoms? And of course, we want to make sure that these patients are exercised. And by exercising these patients, we also find um, the ability for them to understand what to really sort of a not only ascertain whether or not they actually have symptoms, um, but also um, that if we see the lack of contractile reserve, in other words, when the patient's going and having a stress psychocardiogram, in other words, they're exercising, and the heart function doesn't, and the left ventricular ejection fraction doesn't increase by 4%, that is a predictor, it's a poor predictor of survival. So that contractile reserve, just like in aortic stenosis, is also a predictor of, of uh, outcomes with aortic regurgitation. Now, there are some... Um, uh, there is some thought here that we are much too lax about this left ventricular and systolic diameter of greater than 20, 25 millimeters per meter square. We feel that that may be um, too um, um, that may be too uh, lax. If you have an end systolic diameter of 20 or or um, more, what ends up happening is that your mortality for over five years increases at this cut point as opposed to 25, which is what our current cut point is, right? So if we, could it be possible that we are intervening on these patients too late? And the data certainly points that way um, currently. Uh, and I think there'll be certain um, more prospective studies to really kind of get a sense of where, where um, we may want to uh, think about this cut point um, being a little bit more um, rigid than what we have currently. Now, of course, we uh, also have other methods of looking at left ventricular function, and sometimes we see left ventricular function fail earlier than than um, uh, than than just the, di the dilatation. And one of the places where we really see this is with strain. All of you um, who are who who are you know sort of have been working uh, here for long enough know that um, we are we love strain here at Franciscan simply because of our very robust cardio oncology program. But the heart really does multiple things here, as you can see on the left um, panel. The heart has um, what we call radial strain, uh, and uh, this is where the, the the heart fibers thicken in systole. We also see that um, here, but also what we're seeing here is um, um, is longitudinal strain. In other words, seeing how the um, the, the the muscles contract from base to apex um, uh, here, uh, and this and of course um, here you're also seeing um, a similar uh, longitudinal. Uh, change over time. And the, as you see these color differences, you can actually um, look at both circumferential, um, uh, uh, the, the longitudinal strain, um, uh, torsion or torque, uh, and lastly, um, circumferential strain as well. And so uh, here, as we see um, that the use of strain may actually be another predictor of where uh, we may want to um, think about early intervention. And that risk of death increased as the, long, as the global longitudinal strain went um, under negative 19%. So again, a more sensitive tool that's telling us, wait a minute, maybe this whole issue of the left ventricle failing with a left ventricular ejection fraction or dilatation may be a, um, may again be a little too late and using these more sensitive tools may be the way to go. But I think that over time, um, we're gonna see that being the, um, uh, the way to go. Now, lastly, I'm gonna uh, go ahead and uh, end with these um, last couple of slides.
But, you know, AI or artificial intelligence for artif for aortic insufficiency and how far along what are we? Now, there are, there's been fantastic data from our friends at Columbia looking at the measly 12 lead EKG that breaks the QRS complex into 30,000 data points, right? This is an important issue, right, where you have uh, the QRS, um, where the QRS breaks into 30,000 different data points. And based on this very sensitive way in which the electrophysiology of the left ventricle changes based upon the, the, the lesion, you can actually predict aortic stenosis, aortic regurgitation, and mitral regurgitation based on a 12-lead EKG using machine learning and breaking up a KRRS into these very, very small segments, and then understanding the microelectrical electrophysiologic changes that occurs as a, that, as a result of this. Another very fascinating tool is the use of stethoscope-based detection and um, with AI-based um, uh, analysis of heart sounds just from auscultation, uh, uh, there have been now studies looking at how that, uh, uh, how these can help us predict uh, not only um, which a valve uh, is truly what the valve lesion is, but also the grade of the lesion based upon certain auscultatory um, findings that we have. And of course, we have all sorts of echocardiographic tools, which which Dr. Gerdes will talk more about. Medical therapies at this point are very limited. Uh, our usual ACE inhibitors, ARBs. Beta blockers will be less effective because by decreasing the heart rate, you're translating to that higher stroke volume, which unfortunately increases those systolic pressures, which again probably accentuates that regurgitant volume. And with that, I'll leave it to Dr. Gerdish to, um, to finish us off with um, the surgical considerations, and I'll stop sharing my slides. Fantastic. Thanks, Atul. Um, I like about five minutes here, so I apologize. It's yeah, fine, actually. So, you know, I, of course, I always learn something when I listen to you. I learned a little bit more tonight, and I appreciate all of that. Um, I can tell you that the, the uh, MRI stuff has been a game changer, and I, I always breathe a sigh of relief when I remember a patient that um, the echo was mild, but I could hear the murmur. If I can hear the murmur, then it's a big murmur. And we sent this patient, I don't know if you remember, but that patient turned out to have substantial AI and it converted us from doing a minimally invasive mitral valve repair, which I couldn't protect the heart if I had done that operation that way to instead fixing both valves and not having issues with protecting the myocardium and, and hit, leaving that patient with a healthy heart. So uh, that has been a, a big win for us in our uh, practice as well. Now I'm going to share mine here. I find that button. I saw it earlier because I did this with, there it is. Okay. And that's me there, I think. And do you see mine? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. So um, I, I think I'm the last human being on the planet with this video. It, I got it when I was actually a resident, I think, or maybe in fellowship. And it was done at University of Minnesota under the auspices of Medtronic. At the time, they were working with fluorocarbons to carry blood, to carry oxygen as a blood substitute. And they put this little camera in the tip of the left ventricle and they, they did this video. And I think that this is really important to me. And I think it's important to all of us who work in the valve space to rec remember what we're after. Uh, when we are treating folks with valve disease, we are always aspiring to recapitulate what we have, what God gives us, what we're born with, what the divine design is. And in truth, a valve doesn't have to look like a valve. It has to work like a valve. And it has to have certain properties that are important to the global function of the heart. And you see that mitral valve, of course, is integrated into the entire ventricular architecture with the chordae and the papillary muscles. Uh, and the aortic valve is it's like almost like three pockets immediately adjacent to the mitral valve. One opens, one closes. And perhaps the most important thing is what we can't see, which is the surface of these valves, living tissue, uh, our human Teflon, the generation of nitric oxide, prostaglandins, a regenerative surface that uh, can tolerate um, taking a beating and also prevents the, um, the accumulation of platelets and clots. So this is what we're after, right? So uh, I think that when we talk about valve repair today, we're going to talk about aortic valve repair as a relatively new, relatively new. 
Um, we have to start with the father of valve repair period, which is Alain Carpentier. Uh, this is him very early, 1971, kind of bringing to the, to our, to the court of surgery the uh, notion that we could repair valves, mitral valves specifically. Now, that's us when we both had hair, and I was there during my fellowship, and that's us when we both didn't have hair. But the impact of what he did and what I learned from him was that if we repaired a mitral valve versus replaced it, replacing a mitral valve is still a good thing. You take a really bad valve and you give them a better valve, but in a sense, you're trading diseases. If we repair the valve and restore the function of the valve, keep the tissue, keep its biologic activity, keep the performance, then we can restore people to near their normal life expectancy. And indeed, here we've taken that to pretty high levels. We're a recognized center for mitral valve repair, do most of it minimally invasively, do extensive repairs or complete reconstructions of the valve. We can restore those valves to normal function. We've had great success with that. So we know the story for mitral valve insufficiency. What about aortic valve insufficiency? So as Dr. Chug showed us earlier, aortic valve insufficiency doesn't dominate. It's not the dominant pathology, but it's an important pathology. And there are a lot of patients who have these valves that leak that end up having them replaced. And as he mentioned, uh, there's really not a good long-term prognosis for people, even when they're asymptomatic. And so if we look at, and there are these really interesting papers that look at cohorts of severe and even moderate aortic insufficiency, looking at cardiac events, which are congestive heart failure, death related to heart disease, and then survival overall. And we see that even patients with moderate aortic insufficiency, quantified by whatever studies they had as moderate, had a lesser survival than folks in the general population. And that this, you know, this is Demister. This now this admittedly, this is from a center that does a lot of aortic valve repair. So probably the two most pro prominent aortic valve repair centers on the planet are one in Belgium, in Brussels, Belgium, another in Hamburg, Germany. And they looked at what happens if we go with a pre-trigger. In other words, we don't, we're not guideline driven instead of using class one indications or class 2A or 2B. And we can see that folks who have substantial aortic insufficiency, who undergo repair or replacement earlier, actually had a much better survival. And folks with class one indications really didn't do that great. So we can still help them, but class one, we should recognize that the indications for aortic valve insufficiency inter, for intervention really started and came about and haven't evolved much since the 1990s. And that was based off of folks who had heart surgery in the 1980s. So we have to think a little bit about how we've evolved with respect to intervention and methodology of interrogating the heart to determine if people have it. This bears out again, here's Cleveland Clinic data. And as mentioned before uh, by Dr. Chug, that it became so obvious that perhaps we were waiting too long that it has driven our perspective on when to move, even on the echocardiographic data, toward an earlier point. As he mentioned, now you can see that inflection point with a left ventricular end systolic dimension index of only two instead of 2.5, which is the, is the standard guideline, that we see this inflection point in mortality. So growing momentum to move ahead with an index left, uh, left ventricular end diastolic systolic dimension, uh, left ventricular uh, systolic dimension that's indexed and that tells us that perhaps we need to move ahead a little bit sooner. Um, still though, as I mentioned before, the data is based originally on uh, valve replacements. Those valve replacements were done in the 1980s. Things have evolved. We do have better technology in the valve replacement arena, but as I said, whenever we replace a valve, we're basically trading diseases. And no matter what, no matter what replacement valve we use, mechanical or tissue valve, it doesn't matter. Every valve we use carries risk. And the most prominent risk is stroke and overall uh, impact on long-term survival. So what we see from the centers of excellence that have been able to do this over longer periods of time, and then you're gonna see our data, which we, has merged in the same lane, is that if we compare repair versus replacement, folks with, who can get an aortic valve repair have a substantial reduction in morbidity and mortality. So fewer valve-related events and better survival. Inter interestingly, depending on the spectrum of the disease, there may be a re-intervention in there. 
that is on par perhaps with a tissue valve, but the patient spends all that additional time with their own tissue and is not put at risk as they are with a prosthetic valve. And that results in these survival advantages and morbidity advantages. One of the things that we didn't spend a lot of time on with Dr. Chug, though, is the fact that bicusted aortic valve pathology and aortopathy tends to dominate the younger age group who present with aortic valve insufficiency. So we have these patients with aortic valve insufficiency of the various types that were described. And then we have the added layer, the added layer of folks who have bicuspid aortic valves. And bicuspid aortic valves are present in about 1.3% of the population. So chances are you know somebody with a bicuspid valve. And they have a higher, uh, eight times higher incidence of aortopathy associated with it. So we have to be alert to that and manage it. Bicuspid aortic valves have been repaired before, but there is not a standardized methodology for their approach. And as a result, we haven't been able to really democratize the process. When we have somebody with a trileaflet valve who has aortopathy, we have options right away if they have a normal trileaflet valve. This is a patient that we did a little while ago. You see the aortic aneurysm. We look in, we see, oh, look, we've got this nice trileaflet aortic valve. We don't have to sacrifice this valve. This in and of itself is an important uh, element in the sense that some, many times patients have a perfectly normal valve sacrifice at the time of surgery. We can save this valve. We can take everything off, keep the valve, put a new graft on, restore the valve inside the graft, put the coronary arteries on, that's the right main coronary artery. We put those back onto the graft, reconstruct the aorta, and now we have a functioning aorta with an aortic valve, which is great, but we don't always have a normal trileafid aortic valve to work with. As a result, only a small fraction of patients overall presenting with primary AI, uh, aortic valve insufficiency, get repaired. And this is actually a study I dug out of uh, some, I think it was a radiology uh, journal that, because I was kind of curious, like in major centers where people do a lot of valve surgery, obviously we do a lot of valve surgery on a different scale, we're concentrated, but when they're doing, you know, massive numbers of cases, is it different? And it turns out that even in those centers, only about a quarter of the patients with pure AI were being repaired. Again, bicuspid aortic valves need to be addressed. This is Scott Rankin. I showed you Dr. Carpentier earlier. This is Dr. Rankin, who has equally had a very powerful influence on me. Dr. Rankin was chair at uh, UCSF. He's a Duke-trained guy, spent a lot, a lot of time at Duke. And in addition to having an, an enormous clinical practice, also has done a tremendous amount of research. One of the most brilliant people, uh, in addition to Dr. Chug, that I've ever known in my life. So he designed this in response to the need to standardize a methodology for addressing aortic valve insufficiency, that pathology. Could we, could we drive the architecture of the valve toward normal and then reconstruct around that in order to preserve valves? And he came up with a system both for the trileaflet valve and the bicuspid valve. It was based off of the normal anatomy of subjects from CT angiography with point by point reconstruction in three dimensions of what would be normal. And as it turns out, everybody's kind of got this same construct where three spheres fit into your sinuses. Each leaflet would follow the edge of that, of those spheres. And we can predict the geometry that we're supposed to have for a given valve. So here's an example, and I'll move this around along a little bit in the interest of time, but you know, 47 year old fellow, again, this is a trileaflet valve expanding 5.2 centimeter ascending aortic aneurysm. I'm gonna show you the fundamentals of the technique that we use, we employ, for all of these aortopathies, for all these aortic valve diseases. And here's that leaking valve. This annulus is dilated. This patient does have three good leaflets. You can see the, the globes we use. These, we use these balls to ascertain the appropriate dimensions of the ring we should implant. And based on those measurements, we implant the ring. And the important, important points here are, we're gonna implant this, this ring in the subvalvular space in the outflow tract, not touching the valve, but demanding that the annulus now take on normal architecture. And that ring will be planted down beneath the valve so that then the leaflets are assigned their, uh, the geometry that we need in order to work on them, to establish cooptation again, to put the leaflets back in line. The other thing I'll point out is that I'm, we're using proline suture here, and we stopped that. Uh, we actually it took several years to figure this out, but we had a couple of patients over the years, not only us, but other centers, that the, the proline snapped. We changed the type of suture we use. And of course, this has been an evolving process and we use a different suture now. 
and uh, we've not seen that problem anymore. But the vast majority worked out fine, but occasionally we would see that we saw a couple of cases of that. But now the ring gets dropped in, it gets freed into that outflow track beneath the valve. So you might think of this as like if you could have either I, we put a valve in that's made out of cow or pig tissue, or do we put a valve in that's made out of your tissue? So we're essentially constructing the bioprosthesis using your own leaflets. And that frame then sits underneath there to assign the geometry to the valve. And then we do whatever work we need to on the leaflets to get them to coapt or overlap in a normal fashion and reestablish the normal performance of the valve. So after we put these sutures in that loop around the ring, again, keeping the ring below the valve so it doesn't touch the valve, then we also displace those suture posts, those, those um, uh, suture, um, the piles of suture that we make, we need to displace them laterally so that they won't stab into the leaflets. Another thing we learned the hard way. And then after we've accomplished that, now we have a valve that, uh, that co-apps well. Oh, yeah. And functions. My avatar. Right, boom, boom, avatar. Can you go upstairs? So almost the, the thrust of this then became that we recognize, as well as did the folks in Europe, that non-stenotic bicuspid aortic valves could be repaired as well. In other words, if we had good tissue, kind of the principles we learned in mitral valve disease. Mitral valve disease started out as very simple repairs of regurgitant mitral valves, and we moved progressively toward much more aggressive reconstructions of Barlow valves, bileaflet prolapse, extensive reconstructions. We also started to do that in the bicuspid space. Now, these different valves will be associated with different morphologies, though, different phenotypes and different aortopathies. So we had to find a way to unify uh, the principles of what we were doing in order to achieve the same results, even for these various anatomies. One of the things that was recognized early, though, was that for bicuspid aortic valve repair, if we looked across all the centers of excellence, if we looked at all the times that we were successful in repairing a bicuspid aortic valve, we recognized that all of them were driven toward a 180 configuration, and it was based off of what we call the non-fused leaflet. So in bicuspid valves, you've got the fused leaflet, which is kind of like, you know, in, when you're congenitally, when as a fetus, two leaflets don't separate, and that's the fused leaflet. And then you have the non-fused leaflet, which is a normal leaflet. So basically basing the repair off of that non-fused or normal leaflet we made it uh, so that we could establish geometry that would be functional every time. So uh, this is a bicuspid valve now. So this valve, you can see this is a fused valve over here, fused leaflet. Again, we size, we apply the same principles. Of course, we've changed our suture now, as I mentioned before. Uh, release the frame, same process of looping around the frame. And then after we've done that, the, the, the difference here is that you're going to see we're going to measure that leaflet margin and we have to get it where it belongs. So if that's a 23 ring, that's supposed to be about a uh, 33, uh, 35 long uh, free margin. We get that established. We, we, we make it that length and then we assign the same length to the fused leaflet and now we have a functional valve. Now you might say, well, that's not very pretty. It's very pretty to the blood. It has nice blood flow through it. Uh, it is still your own tissue. It will not clot, it will not deteriorate, and it gives us the opportunity to keep your own valve. So with all of these different morphologies, all of these different patterns of aortic valve disease or changes, we're able to then institute this systematic approach. We're able to achieve a functional valve again. And that has led us to dealing with all these different pathologies. Um, so in the interest of time, let me just move along. I'll just show you, these are all just videos that show successful repairs. So for example, this is somebody who had uh, a tricuspid aortic valve with severe insufficiency, and after the repair, it's gone, of course. And here's someone with a bicuspid valve, and we can see uh, eccentric aortic insufficiency due to prolapse of the valve. So prolapse of a leaflet is not a contraindication of being able to fix the valve. It's just something that we take into consideration in the process of repairing the valve. So we uh, began a series of publications or have had a series of publications. Um, this was one of our publications from 2021, submitted in 2021, published in 2022, where we demonstrated uh, through a retrospective review of our data and actually 27 centers across the world, uh, collecting data up to 93 months out 
uh, looking at the uh, repairability of bicuspid aortic valves in the setting of ascending aortic aneurysm. And with a fairly large cohort, 127 patients, we showed that we could leave patients with essentially no insufficiency when we're finished, including at follow-up, with persistent, consistently low mean gradients, a mean gradient of 12 across a bicuspid valve as a mean is not a bad number, and really good outcomes overall. Uh, we did have 4% pacemakers. This is something we've kind of dug deep into to avoid that. We have that's kind of consistent with what it is for a valve replacement. We want everything to be better than valve replacement. So we're pressing hard on that. We have some ideas about implantation technique that we think we've improved to avoid that. But point here is that well-functioning valves, good follow-up and good outcomes. And survival, excellent survival overall, as was reflected in prior studies with valve repair. And Dawn is texting me, so she's probably telling me to get moving. So I'll do that. Uh, we, did, we published another paper on minimally evasive approach, again, with excellent outcomes, learned a lesson about uh, the, the type of suture to use and moved on in our technique. Then we published this on multiple valve repairs, unicuspid valves we've even been able to repair now uh, with a standardized technique that turns it into a standard bicuspid aortic valve repair. Uh, and then uh, aneurysmal AI. This is probably our most important publication. Uh, and I spent a lot of time researching the mechanisms and uh, pathology related to what we call intermediate type bicuspid aortic valves, definitely the most challenging thing to repair. And embedded in this publication were a dozen videos for people to see how to uh, accomplish repairs in these more complex um, aortic valves. Um, finally, this is something we've just started, which is uh, we've in the past when we needed a patch of valve, we would have to use the same thing that we make tissue valves out of, which is, is dead pericardium that's been treated uh, with glutaraldehyde. Now we've started using the patient's own aorta, their own living aorta, uh, to patch and reconstruct valves. And we think this is extremely promising as a method of providing patients with a living patch. Um, we do talk about lifetime management. And if a patient does need a transcatheter valve inside one of these, it can be done. We've done it. I had a lady recently, she was 86 when we put her transcatheter valve inside. I had operated on her when she was 81 and she needed then to have that valve readdressed and we put a transcatheter valve inside her ring. Um, so in conclusion, aortic valve insufficiency can be addressed surgically. Uh, people can retain their own tissue. With the methodology that we have, we have a standardized approach. Last thing I wanted to mention is we now have cardio care uh, coming online. This is an AI uh, program that allows us to integrate data across all of our echocardiographic data and integrate it with EPIC, looking for keyword uh, phrases. And we're able then to identify patients with pathology that might need further investigation. I hope everybody's going to be receptive to learning about their patients that might be at risk. Uh, we're able to run queries at any level. And in fact, all of you, anyone who wants to, can come in and run a query on this as soon as we have it up and running, which will be within a couple of months. That's it. Thank you. Sorry, I had to race a little bit there. Thank you. So anyone, uh, feel free. If you have any questions, we can, you know, we have some time and we're, you know, we can go over if there's any other questions that take us over our time. I have a question. Um, the title of your talk was, you know, AI and the diagnosis and treatment of AI. And when you are, as AI is coming on board, is it going to replace traditional modes of measurement that you've been used to using? How is it going to work with us? I think currently the 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 technology and and where I foresee it occurring will be additive to what we're doing. Um, the especially in the early phases when uh, the problem with AI uh, and what we're seeing in most platforms with AI is oversensitivity. And so what we're going to have to be is is thoughtful about the 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 answers that AI gives us. Um, currently, even when we're looking at, for instance, the EKG related. Um, study that we that we that was published in Jack um, in August of last year. 
again, we, you know, false positivity rates, again, um, were uh, on the, the higher side. Um, and so how do we really um, uh, sort of use that AI platform? Um, it would, I think, help us where I think AI is going to be a, a greatest tool is going to be for population screening um, that would allow us to, rather than having a patient go through the normal um, or, or sort of standard of care testing will allow lower tech um, technologies to give us an indication of whether or not patients have valvular disease, which is vastly under diagnosed in the population today. Um, so when we use things like uh, a um, just an auscultatory measurements or whether we use EKG, um, putting these tools in the hands not only of cardiologists, frankly, where where they really are uh, would be of greater service, which is in the primary care setting. I think that's where we're going to really see AI flourish. I don't know if you had thoughts on that, Mark. Yeah, I think uh, I think that is absolutely true. I also think that what it'll do is help us. To have command of all of the data that we have, you know, it's. I think one of the challenges for us is that we have so much information. For example, from a single echocardiogram, and so we've got all that information, and then we have the information from the echocardiogram that was done before and the one before that. Uh, and to integrate that information and look for longitudinal changes and also subtle alterations. You talked about global strain. Uh, we look at, we sometimes we look at an echo, oh, okay, that's a little bit different, that's a little bit different, does it mean anything? It's hard sometimes to dig down, you have to know what it looked like before. Uh, you know, I had a patient in my office today that I was seeing him, I don't remember what I was seeing him for, it had nothing to do with this, but uh, I just happened to notice that he had right ventricular strain. And then I, I asked him, I said, well, you know, because uh, I was talking to him on the phone, how big are you, do you snore? You know, have you, have you ever, you know, entertained getting a sleep study? Uh, because as we know, these things cascade. So I think that what AI can help us do is to integrate information that we otherwise might ignore or just not notice uh, and do it on a really consistent basis. Because I think the patients have kind of a right to know everything that's happening that gets detected. It's just that it's impossible for us to do that for them. Thank you for that. Anyone else have any questions for us? We have a quiet group tonight. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing I would point out is that, you know, sometimes we look at studies and something got magically better, right? So now the aortic stenosis looks better or the AI looks better or, you know, things that shouldn't get better, they don't magically get better. And, uh, but we look around and the rest of the ventricle looks okay, nothing else has changed. Um, I think that AI with fully integrated understanding of what images we have and what the preceding data was like, because I, again, think we have to be able to look back at the preceding data, uh, will help us to know whether we have appropriate values. Uh, and we could be missing something, obviously, if we don't have the right window, you know, it varies tech to tech, et cetera. So I think that there's opportunity there. Well, thank you very much. We are at our time for this uh, Grand Rounds, and we appreciate the time that you took to join us tonight, and we appreciate Somebody just the time. asked if, sorry, oh. somebody just asked if the procedure is available for pulmonary valve repair. The answer is yes. Uh, we actually turn the ring a little bit different direction, but we have used it for that. It's a little bit uh, challenging, but it, uh, it can be done. Somebody just asked that question, so I thought I'd answer. Okay, no, no problem, no problem. Any other questions before we um, end the program? Well, thank you very much, appreciate it. Don't forget, I will put the evaluation link in the chat and uh, our next car cardiovascular grand rounds will be October the 12th and it will be on vascular disease. So look forward, look for that promotion to come. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thanks for joining us. Good night. <laughs>